Mr. Beat presents Supreme Court Briefs. Paris, France, December 10th, 1898. The United States and Spain signed the Treaty of Paris. No, not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Yes, that one. The one that ended the Spanish-American War. You may remember the war as either a passing mention in your history class textbook or heard about future American President Theodore Roosevelt's service during the war with the Rough Riders. But the war is a lot more influential than many people realize. That's because the Treaty of Paris saw the loser, Spain, hand over its territories of the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico to the victor, the United States. Meanwhile, the United States States had also independently took over Hawaii using the war as political cover. However, the United States government had no idea how to figure out the political and legal implications of these people living in these shiny new territories. While the United States was experienced in dealing with new territory throughout its history of purchase and uh, conquest, Controlling the faraway islands of Puerto Rico and the Philippines were going to be a lot harder than deciding the fate of, say, Kansas and Nebraska. For one, Puerto Rico and the Philippines were colonies, not soon to be states. All the United States government really had to go off of was Article 9 of the Treaty of Paris, which said that number one, quote, the civil rights and political status of the native inhabitants of the territories hereby ceded to the United States shall be determined by Congress. And number two, the little known part about the Dred Scott decision, ugh. That said that, besides getting new states, there's no constitutionally given power the U.S. can use to maintain colonies. But that wasn't going to stop the William McKinley administration and his buddies in Congress from going about it their way. In 1900, the Foraker Act set up a government in Puerto Rico with specific Puerto Rican citizenship for the island's inhabitants. Now, this was not to be confused with, you know, United States state citizenship. It was uh, different. Oh, and the law also had numerous caveats relating to matters of tariffs on imported Puerto Rican goods, which would come up again and again in the most famous or infamous of the, the insular, insular cases. cases. Hold on, Mr. Beats. What exactly are the insular cases? Well, it's what this video is about, you silly squirrel. You see, this episode of Supreme Court Briefs is a bit different because it wasn't clear how the United States would handle the new territories. There were a lot of individual cases that attempted to make the answer to this question a bit more clear. While historians have labeled at least 16 different cases as as part of the insular, insular cases. cases. To keep it simple, I'm going to talk about the ones that left the biggest impact. Oh, and all the ones I picked have to deal with Puerto Rico. Side note, in case you're wondering, the word insular in insular cases comes from how the island territories were under the day-to-day -day control of the Bureau of Insular Affairs. All right, let's go in chronological order then. Insular case number one. In 1899, the Delima Lima Sugar Importing Company wanted to get back what they paid in tariffs on Puerto Rican sugar they imported to New York. They sued the collector of the Port of New York, George Bidwell, reasoning that because Puerto Rico was part of the United States, New York couldn't slap tariffs on imported stuff for Puerto Rico. An appeals court ruled in favor of De Lima, stating that for tax purposes, Puerto Rico was a U.S. territory and not a foreign country. In addition, it said Congress didn't have to write a whole new law to work out tariff laws for Puerto Rican trade. So De Lima Sugar could get their money back. New York appealed and the Supreme Court heard oral arguments from January 8th through the 11th, 1901. In a case now known as De Lima v. Bidwell, the court announced on May 27th, 1901 that it sided with De Lima, agreeing with the appeals court in a 5-4 to four decision. In the majority opinion, Justice Henry Billings Brown wrote that regarding tariff laws, 
Puerto Rico was not a foreign country, so tariffs were not required under the law. Because there was no law from Congress deciding the exact status of Puerto Rico for tax purposes, the U.S. couldn't get away with issuing tariff rules on Puerto Rico for domestic consumption by saying that Puerto Rico is a foreign country. Insular case number two. Hey, it's our friend George Bidwell again. Long time no see. As it turns out, Bidwell's name was on another case decided on the exact same day, May 27th, 1901. A dude named Samuel Downs of the SB Downs and Company was in a similar situation as the DeLima Sugar Importing Company, as he had to pay New York tariffs on oranges from Puerto Rico. Downs said that the the Foraker Act, hey, remember that, still allowed for a special temporary tariff on imports for Puerto Rico, which was unconstitutional because Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution says that, quote, all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Puerto Rico couldn't be the only part of the United States with tariffs like those on their oranges, since all states have to have the same tariff laws on domestic trade. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments for this case, known as Downs v. Bidwell at the same time as they did for DeLima v. Bidwell. However, for this case, the court sided with Bidwell. It was five to four. Although the court said that Puerto Rico was not a foreign country for tax purposes, the island was not fully a part of the United States. However, certain constitutional protections were guaranteed for inhabitants of the island territory only when Congress, quote, incorporates a territory, could the people living there get all the protections under the Constitution? It's important to note that, quote, territorial incorporation doesn't mean an actual legal process Congress uses to suddenly make Puerto Rico or Guam a full part of the country. It's basically a general agreement that certain United States territories are more connected to the country than others. Justice John Marshall Harlan wrote a dissent arguing that incorporation was too abstract and that Congress should give Puerto Rico residents full rights. He added that Congress was restricted to following what was in the Constitution. Incorporation made it so that Puerto Ricans didn't live within the jurisdiction of the Constitution, which was a problem because Congress can only do things according to what the Constitution says. This is where the question, does the Constitution follow the flag, comes from. Does the Constitution apply to everywhere the American government has control over? According to the Supreme Court, the answer is, uh, meh, not really. If a territory like Hawaii at the time was incorporated, that meant that Hawaiians got full protections under the Constitution. But for territories like Puerto Rico and the Philippines, which were unincorporated, they did not have all the constitutional protections. Insular case number three. Now hold up. If Puerto Rico isn't a foreign country, but it's not fully covered by the Constitution, what kind of rights do the actual residents of the island have? Well, the court attempted to answer that question in yet another insular case. It all started with a young woman named Isabel Gonzalez, a native Puerto Rican who went to New York City from Puerto Rico in 1902 in order to be with her fiance. To her surprise, Federal authorities labeled her as an, quote, alien immigrant who would be a, quote, public discharge, meaning she couldn't come into New York as a citizen or United States resident and she could be turned away if she was determined to be a burden on the public welfare system. Given that she was pregnant and unmarried at the time, this might be a real possibility. After being detained, Gonzalez appealed to the local board, which ruled against her. Oh, and representing the other side was the Federal Commissioner of Immigration for the Port of New York, William, William Williams. Williams. That's his actual name. Gonzalez then petitioned the United States Circuit Court for the Southern District of New York, who upheld the board's decision. When Gonzalez took the case to the Supreme Court, Federico de Getao, the first resident commissioner of Puerto Rico in the House of Representatives, basically a representative with no voting power, and Frederic René Couder Jr., who was on the anti-tariff side of Downs v. Bidwell joined forces with her. On January 4th, 1904, the Supreme Court announced that it sided with, um, both? 
This case, known as Gonzalez v. Williams, was unanimous. Basically, the court said that Gonzalez was not an alien, nor a United States citizen. She, along with other Puerto Ricans, could enter the country as, quote, non-citizen nationals, which was basically a status somewhere in between being a full citizen and not a citizen at all. In case you were wondering, Gonzalez herself was already a United States citizen by that point because she had married her fiancé and become a citizen through marriage. Puerto Ricans would eventually gained citizenship as part of the Jones Act of Puerto Rico, signed by President Woodrow Wilson in 1917. However, this case did not give Puerto Ricans full rights as United States citizens. Insular case number four. Okay, so we're jumping ahead a few years now. This one began when Puerto Rican newspaper editor Jesus M. Balzac got sued by Puerto Rico's local government for a libel. The Puerto Rican government wasn't happy that Balzac wrote a negative article that indirectly mentioned Puerto Rican colonial governor Arthur Yeager. You see, even though Puerto Ricans had United States citizenship, Balzac didn't get a jury trial, which is part of the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution. So without a jury, the District Court of Puerto Rico found him guilty. In 1920, Balzac's appeal was rejected by the Puerto Rican Supreme Court, which cited earlier cases to say that regardless of the Jones Act that guaranteed citizenship, parts of the Bill of Rights still did not apply to Puerto Ricans. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments on March 20th, 1922, and announced its decision on April 10th. This one was unanimous. It sided with Puerto Rico. In a case known as Balzac v. Puerto Rico, Chief Justice William Howard Taft's opinion stated that since Puerto Rico was not incorporated into America, which by now meant that it was not designated as ready for statehood, Congress had free reign in deciding how the Constitution applies to Puerto Ricans. It did not matter that Puerto Ricans were U.S. citizens since they previously lived under Spanish law. They would not be ready for the American court system of trial by jury. According to Taft, territories like Puerto Rico and the Philippines, quote, should be permitted themselves to determine how far they wish to adopt this institution of Anglo-Saxon origin and when, unquote. Ugh. Okay then. So that was a big setback for Puerto Ricans wanting to expand their rights. And while we've been talking about Puerto Rico-specific cases, they all represent a larger point of the insular cases. Today, most American territories and their citizens remain in this weird limbo where they are fully a part of the United States for some things, like taxes and citizenship, but they can't take advantage of everything that comes with being part of the Union, like full representation in Congress. While Puerto Ricans do now have rights in courts, they still can't vote in presidential elections or have voting members in Congress. The island has been discussed as a possible 51st state, but not all Puerto Ricans are fully on board with that idea. And just like with the possible statehood of Washington, D.C., today it's a highly contentious issue in Congress. Puerto Rico today remains an unincorporated territory of the United States. As for the other American territories gained during the Spanish-American War, well, the Philippines won its independence in 1935 after years years of persecution and violence. Hawaii became the 50th state in 1959. Like Puerto Rico, Guam, the North Mariana Islands, and the U.S. Virgin Islands remain unincorporated United States territories. Many today argue that the insular cases justified racism, as well as gave the green light to American imperialism, which went on to make a mess in Latin America and around the world. I'll see you for the next Supreme Court case, jury. So what should happen with Puerto Rico? Should it become the 51st state? Should Puerto Ricans get full representation under the Constitution or not? You know, personally, I think that Puerto Rico should become a state and they should get full representation. But you may disagree. Let me know in the comments below. You know, it's okay to disagree with me. And also, while we're at it, what other important insular cases should I have brought up for this episode? Now, helping me narrow them down from 16 to 4 was Jacob Friedman, who basically 
did most of the research, wrote most of the script for this episode, was a tremendous help. And you should check out his political podcast, which is called Gen Zers Talk Politics. I put a link to it in the description of this video. And finally, here's my monthly shout out to all my Patreon supporters who donate at least 10 bucks or more each month to my channel. I'm going to read them off alphabetically this time. Starting with the George Washington level, Alicia Solberg, Andrew B, Austin Ceros, Brady Bardwell, Dr. Paul J. Lilly, Matt Standish, Nick Everett, Sean Connett, and Will Scruggs. At the Grover Cleveland level, Andrew Snyder, Brian Layton, Grant Hughes, Elon Capone, Jack L, Jack Richardson, Jacob Birnbaum, Jar Jar Binks 420, Joel Serrano Lozada, John Johnson, Justin Holt, Kit Walker, Lee Fortier, Naderade, Robert Reichel, Samuel Striz, Southside Mitch, Thomas Oppenheim, Thomas, Victor Martinez, Werner 69, and Zachary F. Parker, and at the Calvin Coolidge level, Adam Christian, C. Bedron, David Segol, Gail Gerard, Laughlin McGregor, Raquel Jones, Sally Thompson, Stephen Scott, and the Geo Scholar. Thanks to all my Patreon supporters, and thank you for watching.